What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Kyle Orlando of eDealer.ca. And Kyle, before I formally introduce you, I want to point out other episodes people should check out of the podcast. Since this is part of the top agency series, um, there's a really good one with Kevin Hergen of Spinutech. And he's been had an agency since 1995. So it's kind of interesting to hear his experience and the evolution of the industry and, you know, his uh, ups and downs, because there were a lot of both. Uh, so check that one out. Um, the other one that was interesting is Adi Clevett. She's got an interesting agency, Kyle, where she does SOPs for companies. So she comes in and she will document their SOPs for them with them. And so that one was really good because we talked about our tech stack. We talked about productivity tools. We talked about operational efficiencies you know, all the sexy stuff that makes businesses run. Um, so check that one out as well. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. And at Rise25, uh, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. And how do we do that? We actually help you run uh, your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do the full strategy, accountability, and the full execution. You know, Kyle, we call ourselves the magic elves that work in the background to make it look easy for the host and the company so they can create great content, develop amazing relationships and run their business, of course. So, you know, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire and, and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com. I also have a lot of episodes about podcasting that are free for people to learn from. So every question I get, usually we create an, a podcast episode about it so people can learn. Um, so I'm excited to introduce uh, Kyle Orlando. He's been working in automotive technology uh, since the beginning in 2003. Uh, he actually started washing cars and worked every job on the way up to now president of eDealer.ca. And Kyle, I, kinda, I love your approach to leadership, which is I work for my employees. So Kyle, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jeremy. I appreciate it. And you know, I, I want to also give a shout out. I watched uh, one of your podcasts in preparation for coming on. And I don't want to butcher the last name. It was John. It was part of your agency series. He he runs, he's been running an agency for years. I can't can't pronounce his last name. I apologize. But um, what's it start with? It started with a T, a T S. Okay. Oh, yeah, Siracus. Yeah, John Siracus. Siracus. There you go. Yes. There it is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed um, the things he's, that he talked about around controlling the, the pipeline and the process for building websites, because that's a big part of what we do as well. And he talked about a lot of the challenges. And it's it's super interesting for me when I can hear other leaders that have been doing it a long time, just like I have been. Um, just the fact that we face this, the same exact challenges, we come up with some of the same exact solutions. So um, I really did enjoy that. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for sharing because I find it fascinating too, no matter what industry, there's kind of a core group challenges. Like yeah. it, it's bucketed in the same type of challenge, even though it's a different category or industry. So let's talk about leadership for a second. And how did you come to you, this leadership approach to I work for my employees? Yeah, you know, even coming into this position um, wasn't something that I was necessarily striving for from the beginning. Um, like I mentioned, I started out washing cars at a small 30 car lot in Sudbury, Ontario, um, left, uh, well, briefly dipped our toe into doing some lead generation in Google back in 2003, um, went away and went to school, got a marketing degree and came back into this now, you know, startup um, marketing company. And uh, from there, from there, I really, like I mentioned, I, I worked every job I could on the way up, whether it was project management or uh, managing our support team. And we got to a point where we, we really reached a threshold um, 
where we were expanding. We were creating uh, E Inc, which is our parent company. Uh, our CEO Jason McClenahan runs was running uh, E Block, and we needed somebody to run uh, E Dealer, and they were going to look externally. Uh, at candidates. And I kind of just raised my hand and said, you know what, I'll do it. I think I can do a better job than anybody else we're going to bring in. And the reason I think I could do a better job is because I know the company, I know the clients, and I know the people inside and out. And and I think that's where it all stems from is, is what, what I was motivated by or where the motivation came from to become president of this company. Uh, it, I was motivated by making sure I took care of my people first and my clients as well. Um, and that's that's how I ended up here. Talk about so who who what other companies are kind of under the umbrella with e dealer? Uh, well, the e Inc is our parent company, and there's e Block, which is a dealer to dealer digital auction. Um, we span across all of North America, um, well Canada and the U.S. specifically, uh, and then and then there's e dealer, which we serve uh, over 1,100 car dealerships in Canada with subscription services. Um, so those are the two uh, primary companies under e Inc. Love it. So. What about, um, are there any resources or people that kind of influence this, uh, this leadership, you know, approach and in, in style for you? You know, that, <laughs> that's a really interesting question because I came up under completely different types of leadership styles. And I'm not saying necessarily different from my leadership style, but completely different types. The, the original founders from eDealer, um, Chris Whitehead and Ryan, McC uh, Ryan O'Connor, um, you know, had completely different approaches um, than I would say myself and different from each other um, when they were building this company. And I just, I tried to take the, you know, I think I did what most people do. I tried to take the things that I really liked and I appreciated about the way that they led the company. Um, and then I tried to integrate my own approach as well. I tried to obviously eliminate some of the things that I I didn't like. Um, so I think it was really the diversity of leaders that I saw on my on my way up that, that influenced uh, my overall leadership style. So just for a second, talk about eDealer and what you do as a company. Yeah, absolutely. We're you know a, a software company serving the automotive industry specifically. Um, the, our core products that we're selling to car, car dealerships and OEMs um, are websites, uh, search engine optimization, and digital advertising. Um, we really specialize, if I was going to say, what's the meat and potatoes of, of why we're the, the best at what we do in our industry is really when it comes down to inventory and automation. That's where we really shine is, you know, when it comes down to it on a dealership website, 80% of your visits are going to go to your inventory. Um, you know, for years, I was arguing with dealers um, about getting their inventory online, period. Um, those times are behind us. Everybody has their inventory online. We know as consumers, we can go on and shop those websites. Um, and, and these dealers put a lot of time and effort and energy into merchandising these vehicles, making sure that all the information is there, making sure those vehicles look great. Um, and so we try to automate that approach as much as we possibly can, because time is money. Um, you know, everything that we do in our subscription service, we try to make it all encompassing. I hate coming back to a dealership and saying, oh, you need to spend more on this or that. It always comes down to time or money. We're going to try to save them as much time as possible. But we also offer some enhancements where they can put some money out if they don't have the time. I mean, as somebody who's worked for small business, I know sometimes time is a very hot commodity. Uh, there's a lot of different areas for attention and investment. So it's always trying to strike that good balance. You mentioned, um, you know, convincing clients of things because you, again, you have a breath and your company has a breath across many, many, you know, dealerships in auto, in the auto industry. So you kind of a unique perspective, but what are some of the mistakes you do see people making that you do have to now that isn't an issue of people, they're putting the inventory, but what is the new convincing that you have to do with companies because you've just seen it work over and over again? Well, I would say that one of the challenges that we face is just a lot of noise. And it's a lot of noise that actually comes out from outside of our industry. And it really started up um, in the dark days, early days of, uh, of the pandemic. Um, I think people were, uh, companies were looking at as an opportunity to grow their business. So there was a huge rush to arms for um, online engagement tools to sell cars online. And a lot of companies were going out to dealerships and saying, oh, free trial this, free trial that, free trial that. And one of the mistakes that I saw is, you know, the most egregious example that we pulled up was we had one of our dealership sites that we pulled up and had nine different e-commerce, sell a car online, digital retailing tools on it, nine. So nine different journeys. Um, we ran into issues of 
uh, dealers signing up for these free scripts, um, we would put them on the website. The, the, uh, the trial would end. Nobody would tell us. Uh, they would turn it off and, and the site would look like garbage because we integrated these tools into the site. So I would say that the, the biggest mistake that I see is really just that um, dealers are promised the world from some that come outside of the industry who truly don't have the breadth of knowledge of working in the industry. So like, what they're going to tell this dealership is going to sound a heck of a lot better than what I'm going to tell them because I'm going to tell them the truth. And the truth is based on experience. I'm not calling other companies that have come in from the outside you know, liars. I'm just saying they don't have the experience to be giving the feedback that they provide to these dealers at times. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what's some truth that you have to correct? Like they think, well, Kyle, I heard this. Yeah. And you have to dispel some of these things that, yeah, with what you do, it maybe doesn't apply just like this other industry. What are some of those? Yeah. The, the two areas you see that most in are digital advertising and search engine optimization, right? So you'll get a company that runs some automated script on a website that returns this report to a dealership that says, oh my God, you've got a thousand, four thousand errors on your site, um, which the report's as good as, you know, trash. It's it, There's there's nothing to it. So I have to talk to the dealer because it, it, it's really trying to strike fear into them. And I think we see that. I get the emails all the time. I'm sure you get them too, Jeremy, about your business. Oh, we've been on your website and it's the worst thing we've ever seen. I mean, I get them from my own e-dealer website. Um, so it's really putting those customers at ease and telling them these are phishing scams. These are, you know, there's a, there's a huge breadth of different reasons why um, these emails are sent to them or these reports are sent to them. Um, so there's that side of it, which is more of the like spammy, scammy side. Um, and then there's the digital advertising side, which what I find there more often than not is um, trying to move the dealer, the customer's attention to specific metrics that doesn't ultimately result in selling a vehicle. Um, so they'll say, well, we're doing amazing in this metric metric in this metric and you should not focus on these other metrics um for us you i see you're actually on our um our yeah if you're watching if you're listening to the audio there is a video version of this and we are on edealer.ca and we can i'm um, poking around here as he's talking so we can kind of visualize it and on the uh the digital advertising page yeah so this is a perfect example of what we stand for when it comes to digital advertising the metrics we drove here on this campaign you're showing on the screen for uh, for Bud's GM, it was all around return on investment, cars sold, business metrics. Yeah, you're highlighting right now, you know, 30% year over year increase. They These were business metrics. This wasn't talking about their bounce rate or their click through rate or anything like that. This was how we drove business working with Bud's and the investments that they made too. I talked about it earlier. This isn't just, you know, pay us some money and you're going to get tons of leads. They made uh, enormous enormous investments on their side as far as time and energy to merchandise their vehicles. So um, those are the things that we're talking about. It's funny that you pulled it up because it was perfect timing. Um, the other side of it is kind of battling um, the companies that we're competing against. That I was having a conversation at a, a Car Guru Summit two, three years ago in, in Boston with a, a large um, dealer group owner from the U.S. and you know, I said to him, he he knew quite a bit about digital advertising and, you know, he's smarter than the average bear. And I said, you know, let me ask you a question. How do I compete with some of these companies that are coming through your door when what I tell you, I know to be true and what they tell you is always going to sound better because it's it's divergent from the truth. Right. So um, it, it's a real challenge. So those I, I know I've been a little long winded on both of these topics, but those are the two truths that I find myself having to talk about. Um, most often, there's a lot of stuff around the website space, but I don't think we even need to touch on that because I think those one of those things that we talked about at the beginning of the podcast, those are the challenges I think everybody sees when building and managing websites. Yeah, I mean, what I want to talk about too is you mentioned the customer journey, right? And I want to talk about your customer journey too, but let's talk about, so we're looking at a website here and because mm -hmm. a website is just, you know, you're taking them through a customer journey, like you said, and you mentioned that. So what are you thinking about with the customer journey when you're creating a website like this? Yeah, I 
think the best place you can draw from is your own experiences as a consumer. Um, you know, you only get to go through it. Typically, most people three, four, five years, depending on how often you replace your vehicle. Um, and I just recently got to to do it. Uh, my wife needed a new vehicle and we got to do it a few months ago. And it's just the best experience as somebody who works and lives in this industry. Um, it's really hard to, to separate what you know from actually being in the consumer shoes. So I got to do that again recently. It's, it's always my favorite thing to do. But yeah, as far as the customer journey itself, I just look at what I would want as a consumer myself. That's always been our focus. So, um, you know, big images, quick navigation. When it came to new vehicles, that was something that we spent a lot of time on. You'll notice on our sites, they all specifically say new vehicles. That's because we have an inventory section. We have a build and price section. We have a showroom section. We have the ability to um, compare trim options. I remember something that stuck with me, um, my aunt, uh, the, the wife of the uncle who originally founded E-Dealer, um, I remember she she lives in Sudbury where it's very often in the winter minus 40 degrees. And she said, I will never buy another vehicle that does not have a heated steering wheel. That was her principle. So like she didn't care about leather and all the other things. She needed a heating steering wheel. So it's funny you say that because when I got my last car, I'm like, who the heck needs a heating steering wheel? Why do I need a heating steering? I mean, I'm in Chicago too. So it's, yeah. it's cold here, but I'm like, that's a thing. So yeah. Yeah. Spend, spend a There's winter. There's a place colder than Chicago, Kyle. Okay. Yeah. What's that? There's a place colder than Chicago. So apparently yeah, exactly. There certainly, there certainly is. There certainly is. Um, but that's what she wanted. That's what she. That's what she for. wanted. So you know, we designed our build and price tool in a way that as you're going through your trim selections, you can see side by side each trim and package and and what options come with that. And so it was really important for me that when we were building out the building price that we did that, we actually just rebuilt it. We're about to release our new version um, in the next uh, quarter or so. Um, And it was important that we retain that to me because I think when you're going through and building a vehicle, um, you want to know, I asked myself, why is this one 23 grand? And why is this one 27 grand? There's a reason. We know there's a reason. What are the reasons? All the reasons are listed out below. So that was the main thing on a new vehicle side. On the used vehicle side for the customer journey, it's really just the completeness of information. What are the two things you care about when you're buying a used car? The price and the mileage and the car, the Carfax report. We'll say that too, but the price and the mileage. So it's important to me that anywhere that a used car shows up on a website, price and mileage are, are really are right next to each other. Big images, easy to navigate. So I know that a lot of the concepts that I'm talking about right here are, are pretty simplistic, I think. But I think they need to be simple. They need to start in a simple place. If you start overcomplicating it, that's when you really start to get yourself into trouble and, and creating like that the the joke I told earlier about the the website with nine different uh, uh, paths to conversion. Let's talk about your website, and because I know you've again, this is, you guys specialize in this for dealerships, right? And but you eat your own dog food as well. So talk about your website and why some of these elements are the way they are here. Well, I will start off by saying we're in the process of a rebuild right now, and it is the carpenter's house. So <laughs> that's how I feel about it. Um, but but we know, see some things like right here at the top. There's a, a specific yeah. clear headline. You ha- you want people to do certain things here. Just walk me through yeah. the the thought process. Yeah, well, you'll notice our requested demos highlighted and and our latest innovations isn't. Why? Because that's ultimately where I'm trying to drive the user. Um, There is some, you know, one of the retailers that I borrowed a lot of information uh, uh, from early on was Zappos. Zappos is known for having a great online experience. They're known for having uh, great customer service. That was a company that I admired from from when they first, first started and I was in college and I ordered shoes from them. Um, so I looked at what Zappos did. I looked at what Amazon did, two major successful retailers, um, and looked at how they set up their calls to action. How do you drive people down the path to conversion? And it's really just giving them that green light of consistency throughout the website so they, that you know there is contrast between something that is a tool or a feature that you're going to do research on or a button that's gonna take you down a path to conversion. I would say that's kind of rule 1A for me, is making sure that when you're on a website, the website is clearly telling you to go down one of these two paths. Um, Either path is fine. I think we all know anybody who has a website, you want them down that path to conversion, but not everybody's gonna click that request a demo right off the homepage, right? You need to take them down into those research sections. So um, yeah, I'd say that's the overall philosophy. And then you could see it applied throughout this website as well as our dealer websites as well. 
I mean, the other thing I see here, you you know, there's a video, right, obviously, that people can click on, so it's information. You also have some social proof elements here with the different, you know, we see Toyota, Lexus, Ford, GM um, here, and also um, this, this chat, Yeah. right? So talk about, I mean, I've had a lot of people kind of, I don't know, struggle is the right word, but like, should we put a chat on there? Because now we have to woman or man the chat right and so, yeah. so the decision to put a chat on there is not an easy decision to make either yeah you know it's funny that you bring that up it's it's actually a great example of of sort of how uh i approach our company and 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 so forth it's not showing my picture right now but i am signed in right now so um a few months ago one of our large dealer groups from out west um had been with us for years uh was messaging through the chat for a support issue and i answered it um, and Reese was like, is this actually Kyle or somebody pretending to be Kyle? And I was like, no, this is Kyle. He's like, I'll never get over the fact that you're the president of the company and you're still answering chats on the website. Um, you know, when we talk to our customers, they're running a very different business than us, the car dealerships, right? So it is very difficult for them to man those chats and, and answer those chats. What, you know, my guidance has always been is, hey, you got to treat it just like a phone call. It's just as important. Um, but I understand that they're facing different challenges than we are. Uh, on this drift chat, which is a third party tool that we subscribe to, um, you know, myself and four or five other people are all signed into it on our cell phones right now. So when somebody starts a chat, it'll immediately flag and I get a notification from the app on my phone and uh, wherever applicable, we can start um, talking with uh, the customer or whomever it is. So um, that tool has been on our site now for probably five or six years and and we love it it's been it's been fantastic and i like having that insight i like that my phone gets lit up with with the commentary and i like to see what's going on and what people are asking about even though i might only be answering you know 10 percent of the chats yeah you kind of it allows you to have your finger on the pulse of things exactly yeah what else um kyle from a tech stack perspective that you like it could be apps on your phone that you use personally or business but so you use Drift. What are some other things that you use as a company or that you find productivity wise personally? Yeah, I mean, Slack is one that obviously I think most tech companies, a lot of companies now are using. Um, adopting Slack and the different um, the different um, groups and ways that you can set it up to be more efficient. So you're only getting the communication you really need. Uh, <clears throat> we did a major um, migration from the Microsoft stack over to uh, the Google workspace in the last uh, two years, which I was extremely resent resistant to. I was just resistant to change. I've been on the Microsoft yeah. stack for, I don't know, 15 years, whatever. Um, and I have absolutely loved it um, as far as like- What being, prompted the change, right? Because like so changing something yeah. like that is a big decision, is a big a implementation. Decision. It's a It's an annoyance. Like I could see why you'd resist something like that. Yeah, well, because our company was growing so rapidly, when I say our company, E Inc. itself, um, and we just wanted to get everybody on the same stack. Some people were using Google uh, Workspace, some people were using Exchange, and it just made sense. Like you know, from a technology standpoint, it just it made sense. We're all using Google Sheets, we're all using Google Meet, and it, it just made sense. So I, it's funny. I watched over the last year or so just the way we started eliminating <clears throat> other pieces of technology, go to meeting, for example, things of that nature, Zoom, um, and just using the full Google suite. And I will say in the early days when I was using it, say, three, four years ago, um, when Google Meet was still not predominant, um, I just I had a lot of technology issues with it, like a lot of connection issues, just problems with it. But um, I will say it's been a fantastic experience over the last year or so using that. I would say the one specific thing that was a huge um, draw for me is the calendar functionality and be able to see people's availability. That has saved so much time where we just didn't have that before. I love to talk about the trajectory of your journey um, because it's not often that I hear, oh, this person started as a, you know, washing cars, and now he's president type of thing. What were some, and it, what are some of the positions that you held throughout your journey and maybe something you learned that that brought you to, you know, gives you a, a better viewpoint as, as president. Cause I know you started, you, you did support, you did project management, you did strategy, you did all these things. Maybe just take me through the timeline of the position. And then one thing that you, you took out of it. Yeah, sure. 
<clears throat> and so, as I mentioned, you know, this company e dealer was born out of that small 30 car lot where I was just a lot boy, basically doing anything that needed to be done from delivering cars four hours to Toronto or washing a car or putting on a snowmobile suit in minus 40 and blowing all the snow off the cars. Um, from there, I came back in 2009 uh, and started off in customer support. At that time, uh, our entire customer support team was located in India. Uh, we had uh, six or seven um, support reps there. We had, I believe, four develop web developers. Um, and so I was um, sort of managing that team and, and running customer support myself. Um, and that's when I first started to recognize the inefficiencies of having the, the offshore team. There were certainly savings that we needed as a small startup um, to, to leverage those offshore resources. But I was seeing kind of the, the give take in that. Um, and so as we went through that, I started really just trying to focus on quality over quantity. Um, and when I moved into the project manager position out of the customer support and customer support management role, um, I really started to see it. Uh, I really started to see what we were losing offshore. And again, we are talking, you know, 13 years ago. Um, so it could have changed or could have been just my experience. I just want to outline that. Um, but communication issues, timing issues, um, just overall quality issues. And so while I was in um, project management, I put together a business plan to, to move us onshore. Um, and so and we kind of never looked back. Um, was we that still something that you initiated or did yeah. someone higher up was like, hey, we want to move this onshore? That's something you were like, I think this will improve the company. So you were bringing new, fresh ideas, essentially. Yeah, at that point, you know, I had already had the experience in our customer support department. I had the experience now in project management. That's two of the main parts of the customer journey. That's that's where you're interacting with the customer. That's where you have key deliverables. And so uh, it was clear as day to me. And so it was really like, well, here's the budget, figure out how to get it done. Um, and, and that's what I did. And so we didn't do it. We didn't, it would, definitely wasn't a Band-Aid pull. Um, we did it slowly and methodically. And we did have to go, you know, from, you know, four resources down to two in certain areas. But what I found was it wasn't just the, that the productivity or the quality of the individuals was better, but the communication was so much better and cleaner and streamlined that the productivity went up. Uh, does that make sense? The way I'm describing yeah. That? yeah. Yeah. So customer support, then project management, and then you brought this to bring it on shore. What was next? Uh, from there is when I started, I moved into sort of my marketing and product role. Um, and so I know that's kind of a, a weird mix looking back at it now, but uh, I had the marketing background. Uh, we weren't doing a lot of um, specific marketing. We were doing marketing for our clients, but not marketing for ourselves. Um, so I started focusing on that and then just finding ways to improve the product. So a lot of the stuff in the philosophies I just talked about earlier was we were talking through um, our philosophies of setting up a vehicle details page or a listing page or the home page, working with our uh, CTO at the time to give them that feedback and tell them exactly what we needed in our next iteration uh, was some of my main focuses there. But that's also, you know, when I started dipping my toe into the sales waters. Um, at that time, we had a third party um, that was kind of our sales arm. So we paid them to do all of our sales. That's what they did. They did an excellent job. They opened tons of doors for us. Um, but it was expensive. It was expensive to outsource your your sales uh, force. So I started dipping my toe in there. And that's when um, shortly after, there's kind of three things going on there. So I'm involved in product. I'm involved in marketing. I'm involved in sales. And we figured out that we can make a, a lot more investment in the company and in the product and the, the ops folks if we brought the sales in-house. So we moved um, Shane Hambly, who's been with the company. He's with the company a year longer than me. Uh, he's still with us. Uh, as our VP of real estate at the E Inc level, um, we brought him out of that organization over to us, and he and I just led this, just led sales, just the two of us from then forward for until I think 2018. Um, and I learned a tremendous amount from him about how to sell, how to present, um, how to present yourself. Uh, learned a lot in those few years. Uh, kind of, he took me under his wing on the sales side, and that's that's really how I got interested in the sales side of the company. Talk about that for a second. So what was some of the advice he gave on when you say how to present yourself or just on sales in general? 
Well, for one, he got me dressing better because I wasn't <laughs> I wasn't in the office anymore. I was going out to uh, to visit with clients. Um, but it was just the way he held he held himself. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier earlier about the diversity of the leadership that I saw on my way up, and he's he's one of those leaders. And you know, it, our sales styles couldn't be any more different. Anybody who knows us would tell you that our sales styles today are very very different. But for me to learn those things, I would say everything he's strong at were some of my weaknesses. Like he can stand in front of a boardroom of of 20 quiet people and just present and absolutely kill it. That's not my style. This is my style. Having a conversation with somebody, having a conversation with a group of people is absolutely my style. Um, so the way, you know, his presence, his ability to prepare for a meeting, be prepared for anything, those were some of the things that I took away. And it just, it really gave me the, laid the foundation for me to create my own style and understand that I could go into a meeting confidently and close. What were some of the things that you had to bring, do to bring the sales in-house or that you learned from that outsourced sales team? Like, let's say someone's in a similar position. She's like, yeah, we've been outsourcing sales or we want to just be better at sales. What, what did you learn from the outsourced sales that you brought? The number one thing I learned in SaaS, which has been my experience, is more salespeople does not equal more sales. That's number one. Quality over quantity. As I mentioned earlier, um, you know, we we're competing with companies with bigger war chests than us, companies that are bundling, for example, like I'll give an example, Auto Trader, who has a marketplace and makes tons of money off of that marketplace and then bundles it with websites um, and has a ton of reps on the road. Meanwhile, I have four. You know, back then we had two. Um, it's really about the quality of those interactions. And that's not taking anything away from that third party company that helped us grow in those early days because they were fantastic. But what they were really doing was just opening doors and then Shane was going in and closing the door, right? So um, that's what we learned was just that. At they were that kind point, of acting we got, as like a sales development rep and they were kind of getting yeah. in the door. But then ultimately you you still had to do the sales, like do the final closing of any deal. Exactly. and And I think... Once my uncle was still running the company at that time, Chris Whitehead was still running the, the company at that time. And he saw me dipping my toe into the sales and that I was having some early success and said, well, now we've got two people that can do this. I think we can do this. And then we went over the raw numbers and just said, we're giving away 40% off the top line right now to this third party sales company. We can take that. We can invest in onshore. We can rebuild our product. We could just take that money and use it in so many other effective ways. I'm curious, Kyle, about the project management side of things. So you go from customer support to project management to strategist to marketing and product development, and then eventually on the president. But backing up to the project manager, you know, each time you had to kind of replace yourself in that position. That's right. So from the project management piece. What were you looking for? What do you look for in in someone that um, is a really good project manager, right? Because it's not like when you were, when you studied in, you know, in school, right? You were like, I'm going to be a, you weren't studying specific or you didn't have a certification project manager. I mean, you did marketing in yeah. school. So what did you find? What did you find of the, the you know, actually the qualities and, and characteristics of someone who what is a good project management replacement for you? Yeah. I mean, you have to be an excellent communicator. Number one, you have to be confident and you have to be organized. I mean, those are the the, the key tenants that I see in that role. Um, the confidence part, I would not underrate. Like it's, it's so important when you're having these conversations with people about their websites. I'll go back to, I was watching that pod, previous podcast with John on it and he talked about it as well is setting up those guardrails. Um, and making sure that the customer feels heard and making sure that all those things are happening. If you don't have confidence going into that um, and you don't have a good plan in place and you don't have your milestones set and all those things, you either have it or you, or you don't. Like it, it's really been my experience. So we, we've had some people that we brought into the company um, to work in that position that have been really great people. I've actually moved them into other areas of the company, but I do see that role as a very specific skill set and a specific role. That said, I do believe that many, many people are capable of being successful at it. 
It's also the wherewithal of wanting to do it. I think a lot of people that could be good at it end up in sales when maybe they have some more upside opportunity for um, for income, right? So uh, it is an interesting role. It's one of my favorite roles, if not my favorite role on the way up. Um, and it was very difficult. As you said, I had to replace myself each step of the way. Um, and I learned a lot in that. We just recently um, had somebody that that didn't make it past her probation uh, period and I had a, um, a follow-up meeting with the managers that were involved in the hiring and ultimately um, the letting go of the employee. And I, I sat down with them and I said, what did you learn? What did you learn from the interview process to the onboarding to now the offboarding? What did you learn? Um, and, you know, they, they did learn that you got to, uh, I've heard the term before, you know, fire fast, hire slow. Um, which I think really absolutely applies here. Um, and I said, look, guys, you know, I've been duped by people that are really good interviewers before. So don't be embarrassed. It's happened to us all. You work long enough as a manager or a leader in, in, in any industry, you're going to be duped. So don't feel bad about it. Just understand how to identify and move past it as quickly as possible, because you're only hurting yourself by trying to what I call manage incompetence. There's nothing that I um, that bothers me more than than managers who think they can manage that they're so such good managers that they can manage their way through incompetence. And I mean incompetence in the true meaning of the word. First of all, Cal, I, I want to thank you. I have one last question. Um, before we end, I want to just point people to check out edealer.ca to learn more and more episodes of the podcast. But um, my last question kind of goes along the, you know, you've kept going into increasing roles and responsibilities. What does um, your role look like at president now? Yeah, uh, it's been interesting because, you know, I've liked everything I've done along the way. I've been in this role now. I was I surprised. I looked at looked it up the other day because I couldn't remember when it was, but it's six years now. And uh, I, I find myself removed from the day-to-day -day of the business more and more, which I don't like. So I find ways to keep myself engaged, like the chat that we talked about earlier, or just with my, my leadership team. Um, I've, I've just, I've learned a ton in the last three years, I'd say, since we really hit a growth spurt, um, since our company IPO'd and just being responsible for a PL and l and all of those things. So it's funny because I was one class away from a minor in finance in, in college. And I didn't take that class because I did not like finance. <laughs> and the amount of time that I've had to spend um, in spreadsheets and in financials, but it's been for the betterment. So, I mean, it looks very different than what this role looked like when I first began. Uh, it's very different, but I think that it's given me a tremendous amount of experience as I go forward in my career and I wouldn't trade it for anything, but it, it has brought its own challenge, challenges. I mean, so there are days that I get out of bed and say, Oh, why did I ever stop just doing sales? That was so much fun. Uh, but I was talking to my director of sales the other day, and she said to me, "Oh, why did I ever stop doing support?" I the just, grass I is always greener. The right? office. What's that? The grass is always greener. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but like I said, I wouldn't trade any any of it for anything. It's been an excellent experience. I've I've learned a lot from my CEO Jason McClenahan, who's been so supportive because you know he comes from a different side of the business. He, it's transactional, it's auctions, it's very different from my business. And he's been very supportive of as a leader, uh, but also given me so much room uh, to run my part of the business, which I am so appreciative of. Kyle, I want to thank you. Everyone check out edealer.ca and more episodes of the show. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot, Jamie. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.